Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In this special episode, we sat down with Dr. Robert Atkinson, president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. He compares how nations are doing in terms of global market share in the Hamilton Index, assessing national performance in the competition for advanced industry. How has the Chinese regime gained such a leap over the past quarter century? And how is that impacting America? Let's dive in. Dr. Atkinson, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. So just this week, a group of bipartisan lawmakers is really pushing Congress to screen investment into China, especially in key sectors. And your foundation just came out with a report kind of comparing how nations are doing in terms of technology and other production. So to begin with, how are the U.S. and China faring? China's doing very well. The U.S. is going down, let's put it that way. Uh, the U.S. used to be dominant, and now we, we actually estimate, even though the data we could get was from 2018, that was the latest, we estimate that today China is outproducing the United States in advanced industries. Um, these are industries that you can imagine, like computers and semiconductors, machinery, automobiles, drugs. When you put that, put all those together, those seven industries, um, China went from about 4% of global production in um, 1995, and now they're about 22, 23% of global production. So a phenomenal story. The U.S. has lost share, and we actually are, these industries make up a smaller share of our economy now than they do in China. And so what led to China's kind of gain and the U.S.'s loss? Uh, a simple way to put it for China would be that they decided to engage in a whole set of unfair practices, uh, massive subsidies, manipulation of their currency to keep the price down, uh, forcing foreign companies to transfer technology that then goes to the domestic Chinese companies. So a whole suite of things that gave them an unfair leg up. Um, for the United States, the answer is that we just didn't do anything. We, um, too many economists in the United States like to say, uh, agree with the phrase, potato chips, computer chips, what's the difference? Uh, in other words, it doesn't really make any difference whether we have a strong semiconductor industry or a strong machine tool industry. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And because so many people, so many economists in particular and policymakers who listen to them believe that it doesn't matter, we've lost global market share there. China, it matters to China. They're, they've set their sights on dominating these industries by the year 2025. Um, so we'll see. And Dr. Atkinson, neoliberalism has argued that global trade and cooperation between countries, especially in tech, is a win-win situation. But when it comes to China, it seems that when China wins, the U.S. loses. So why is that? As they say, it, it works in theory, but does it work in practice? No, it doesn't, uh, because China is not playing by the rules. They're not a normal economy. So when Ricardo, uh, David Ricardo, wrote about trade back in the 1820s, and that's where everybody is thinking, they're thinking in terms of Ricardo, this notion of comparative advantage. You know, China's good at uh, solar panels and we're good at semiconductors. Problem is China wants to be good at everything. And China is using a strategy to dominate every single sector. You, air, aerospace is a really good example. There is simply no way that China would have a domestic aerospace industry uh, without government involvement. Right now, there's two major airline companies, uh, Airbus and Boeing. Not going to be a third. It's too hard an industry. It's really, really complicated. And yet China is pouring hundreds of billions of dollars into their state-owned enterprise called COMAC to build what they're building as a C919 that, you know, within a certain period of years will mean that no more Boeing or Airbus planes are going to be sold in China. That's not fair trade. That's not free trade. So if we were competing, like, for example, when we compete against Canada or Germany, yeah, it's pretty much win-win. We do some good things and trade those and import other things. China is just not in that category. And Dr. Atkinson, it seems when it comes to China, right, politics reigns supreme in anything. And so in doing business particularly, 
say China kind of has politics first, but free markets go on the principles of trust and credibility. So how would you manage those two in this situation? Well, I'll give you an example. If you if you cross the Chinese Communist Party, you're a company, let's say, and you do something they don't like. Um, and let's say you do something in the U.S. that the government doesn't like. Government can't do anything to you and they won't do anything to you. They might not like it, but they can't do anything to you unless you break the law. In China, you don't have to break the law for the government to go after you. And the Chinese government does go after you. They'll, they'll conduct raids at six in the morning. They'll put executives of, of, of American companies in almost in detention uh, just because they don't like what they did. And they're, they're, excuse me, they're using the government to force these companies to do what the Chinese government wants. Ultimately, there's really nothing we can do about that. Um, we can't change what China's doing. They're going to keep doing it. What we can do is we can keep them from benefiting from it as much. So, for example, one of the things that the Trump administration did was to say um, that certain exports from China that are based upon intellectual property theft, where they've stolen U.S. intellectual property, we're going to put big tariffs on those. So we can make it harder for China to profit from its um, uh, if you will, economic predation or predatory practices. Uh, I don't believe we can stop the Chinese government itself. They seem pretty uh, hell-bound and determined to go down this path. Uh, the only thing we can do with our allies is to make it harder for them to profit by those kinds of practices. And so on the current standing, how would you describe the U.S.-China trade relationship as it currently stands? Well, one of the things I think a lot of people have made a mistake on is they say, well, uh, the U.S. and particularly President Trump started the trade war. Uh, that's not really true at all. It, it's as if you're in a, a shooting war and someone has been lobbing bombs at you for 15 years and then you decide, oh, I better lob a bomb back and then you get called for starting the war. Uh, what Trump did was just simply recognize that China has been playing not by the rules. They've been stealing intellectual property, forced tech transfer. I mean, you name it, cyber theft. It's not playing by the rules. China has declared war on the U.S. economy uh, for really 20 years. And what the Trump administration did was acknowledge that and say, we're not going to stand for it anymore. Uh, and we'll see what the Biden administration is going to do soon on that. So. China could fix this pretty quickly if they wanted to. They really could. There's no, the, the U.S. policymakers, the U.S. government doesn't want to keep China down. This isn't anything about keeping China down. What U.S. policymakers want is for China to play by the rules like pretty much everybody else does. If they did that, the trade war, quote unquote, would go away tomorrow. But they don't want to do that. So. What would be some of the rules if China played by would allow the kind of relationship to go back? Well, there are really three or four main things, and they're all things that we could measure. Um, and this is one of the things that I thought the Trump administration should have done, but they didn't do. The number one is cyber theft. So we know how much intrusion the Chinese hackers have, most of them backed by the government, where they come into a major American corporation, they steal their patents and designs and all of those kinds of trade secrets using cyber means. That's number one. We need we we can tell the Chinese government, hey, when you stop doing that, we'll get back to normal. That's number one. Number two uh, is requiring technology transfer as a condition of market access. Now, the Chinese government says they don't do that. We all know they don't. We all know they do do it. They just don't they don't put it on paper. They're, they're not dumb enough to put it on a piece of paper. Once you put it on a piece of paper, it's against the law under the World Trade Organization. But they don't put it on paper, but they still do it. So no more forced technology transfer. And a third would be really cutting way, way back on these massive subsidies. So if you look, for example, at the semiconductor industry, an industry that China is weak in, uh, they're putting in uh, anywhere between 100 to $150 billion dollars of government money into one industry. Uh, the, the think tank CSIS came out with a report uh, about two weeks ago comparing Chinese subsidies to pretty much everybody else uh, on a per GDP basis. China is 10 times higher than everybody else. So they need to get, they need to just stop that, bring it way, way down. If they did those three main things, 
uh, I believe we could start to have a conversation about coming back to some kind of normal trading relationship. And so going forward, what can the U.S. do to kind of maintain the lead without kind of compromising their own morals and things? What can the U.S. do? So we've got to do two main things. One is uh, we need to pass this competitiveness legislation now that's in the House and the Senate, ideally the Senate version, because it's much better than the House version. And we can't then go, OK, well, we passed that. Well, let's, let's move on to other things. We've got to keep at it year after year after year. What's next? What are we missing? What do we need to do next? Uh, we can't take our eye off the ball of rebuilding and, and strengthening U.S. advanced technology competitors. It's just we're going to have to do that for the next 25 years minimum. But we also have to work with our allies to limit the ability of China to gain advantage by unfair means. Um, and there are lots of ways China does that. For example, I would I would have an agreement with our allies to say that we will never, ever buy a, um, a COMAC plane. Just never going to buy it, no matter what, no matter how cheap you can make it, because COMAC planes are illegitimate. They're subsidized. They're, they're, they're not the result of anything related to the market. You could say the same thing about Huawei uh, telecom equipment. Huawei has received over $700 billion dollars. Sorry, excuse me, over $70 billion in subsidies from the government. The original technology from Huawei was based upon foreign technology that was forced to be transferred. Why do we allow that? Why do we say, hey, it's okay if you do that? Same thing with high-speed rail. Uh, high, their, their entire high-speed rail industry was based upon forced technology transfer from the Japanese and the Germans. Why do we allow uh, governments to buy uh, or, or industry, uh, companies to buy Chinese high-speed rail. We should just say, no, you, you gained that illegitimately. You gained it unfairly. We're not going to reward you because of that behavior. So we need to start doing that. That's going to be a big lift. Um, not very few people are really thinking about that, but that's what I think we have to start to do. And Dr. Atkinson, any last words you'd like to add? Well, I think the, the last words would be, it's easy for the average person to not really think about this because People don't see it. People who might see it, if the factory they're working in closes, then it's very real, very painful to them and the community. But by and large, most, most Americans don't think about this too much. And yet, what made America the most powerful country in the world, the richest country in the world, was because we were leading in advanced industries. And we're no longer doing that. And if we can't get that back, then I really worry for the country's future. So we just need to buckle up and really put our mind to it and continue to do what hopefully what Congress is going to do soon. Dr. Atkinson, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you on the show. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. That was Dr. Robert Atkinson, president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. And for those watching our full episode, joining us after the break, John Pelson, author of Wireless Wars, China's dangerous domination of 5G and how we're fighting back. He touches on how free trade ties into geopolitics and how this could play out going forward. Our full episode can be watched on our partner platform, Appbok TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer, and see you soon.